Our world is changing fast. And with this comes the need to keep pace. To create, evolve, and deliver solutions that meet our customers' needs and improve their lives. At Swift, we're collaborating with the brightest minds to make transactions faster, smarter, better. Because we believe some challenges are meant to be solved together. With our community, we're reimagining what we can achieve through innovation. Investing in a new AI platform that will power the creation of smarter solutions. Like real-time anomaly detection to validate transactions before they're sent. We're reaching into the world of central bank digital currencies to reduce fragmentation, connect up technologies, and enable new possibilities for sending digital money across borders. And we're guiding securities players through the emerging world of tokenized assets, increasing the speed and efficiency of post-trade processing to help a new market grow. These innovations will help our community adapt to finance's ebbs and flows, not just to stay afloat, but to thrive and lead both today and in the future. But we're not embarking on this journey alone. We're encouraging our community to join us too, to innovate with us, and be part of shaping the future of finance. Faster. Smarter. Better. A warm welcome, everyone, to the sixth edition of Inside Innovation Live, a series of shows where we delve into the exciting innovations happening all across financial services. I'm Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at SWIFT, and in this very special episode, we're looking back at the year in financial innovation, discussing the successes, failures, and lessons learned in 2022, as well as making some of our predictions for 2023. Now, last time we promised you for this session a fintech superstar, uh, and we certainly delivered on the promise today. Um, so to help me uh, discuss this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Lady Glyptis, Chief Client Officer at 10X and all-round fintech guru. Lady, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, and what an introduction, Nick. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. So... Maybe you could kick off um, by telling us a bit about yourself and your work in the world of, of banking and fintech. Of course, I uh, I went to a, an event just before COVID and they um, they gave me a batch that had a big V on it. And I said, what is that? And they said veteran. And I was like, oh, I think you just told me old. Um, but after I digested it, I um, I decided it was a big compliment because that's exactly what we are. So I've been in in this space for coming up to... 20 years now. So I was a banker uh, for a very long time. I'm still a banker in recovery. I don't think you ever stop thinking like a banker if you've been trained as one. But I was lucky enough to catch the fintech wave pretty much from day zero with the wider team from Swift and the time when the fintech community could fit into a room. And we've seen such transformation and I've, I've been lucky to be part of this from, from the get-go. <clears throat> as a banker and, and transformation leader inside the bank and, and then crossing the, the divide and uh, on the entrepreneurial side and working inside providers such mm -hmm. as 10X um, in the cloud native core banking system. How was Great. that? Whistle Great. Stop that was tour of the Yes, that, that was that was awesome. And, and clearly, we've got something in common here, because I, I was on a, a webinar a few months ago, and I also got to, described as a payments veteran. And I thought, I didn't think I'm I was I'd been in the industry that long. But I guess you accumulate, uh, you know, time flies, right? Um, it really does. So, so um, thank you. And, and a huge welcome to the show. Um, 
Before we get into the discussion, it's great to see almost 140 people uh, now already joining us uh, today. Um, for those who are following us on, on the LinkedIn stream, please feel free to ask questions on the stream and we'll try to answer them uh, as many as, 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 as we can as possible. I know time will fly on this, uh, as it always does, um, but we'll, we'll, try, we'll try and pick, uh, pick some, some great, great questions. So please add them on the, uh, on the stream. Later, before we, we discuss the key innovations we've seen uh, this year, I'd like, first like to step back and look at the big picture. And I know you do this a lot with your, your blog that I'm a huge, uh, huge fan of. So, so maybe we could start by talking about, you know, as we approach the end of 2022, where do you think we currently stand in terms of the financial industry's digital transformation? Where, where are we now on this, on this journey? It's a big question. We could take the entire time asking this question. I think it would be fair to say at the beginning of the year, it, even before everything that transpired um, did, I think it would be fair to say that the digital transformation journey is getting harder because mm -hmm. we've been at it for 10, 15 years and the low-hanging fruit has been reaped mm -hmm. and the pieces of the puzzle that are left require cross-industry collaboration, as you know so mm -hmm. well, require big transformative decisions in the core of the businesses and as to the core of the business. So both mm. the systems used to, to deliver the work, but also what is the work for. So it was getting harder anyway. Mm. And I think it's fair to say that we emerged from COVID having learned a lot and not you know, at, at Cybus this year, people were like, how did we do as an industry? And it, mm. it was fair to say, we have done okay. You know, mm. a lot of the banks, a lot of the financial service providers went into lockdown with very limited digital tooling for colleagues um, mm. and, and sort of stepped up where they needed at huge personal cost for the mm. team involved, but actually delivered. But as we were coming out of what everyone felt was the defining crisis of a generation, we stepped into what is undeniably a recession, a global mm. recession. Yes. War in Europe, potential conflict looming in China, supply, mm. um, sorry, around China, um, <laughs> supply chain crisis, energy crisis. So if we started the first half of the year a little bit tired, we're ending the year in an undeniably difficult position. Now, mm. the recession, the contraction, we're definitely seeing it with fintechs um, shrinking and laying people mm. off. Mm. The funding environment's freezing. Um, it's going to be a, a challenging 2023 in that sense. Mm, mm. But I am hopeful, <clears throat> convinced might be too strong a word, but hopeful that the digital transformation of the industry as a whole and of the big institutions will, will be impacted but not stalled by this. Mm, because at the end mm. of the day, um, this might be existential for some smaller companies, but it won't be existential for Swift. It won't be existential for the big banks. So it might, if anything, and this is sort of the optimistic bit in me, it might give us more focus. Mm, mm, mm. That's an interesting point. And I guess if you if you if you look back and we, we we've both lived through financial crisis dot com before that. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, there was there was a huge, you know, there was a huge contraction of the times of those things but equally they they did force as you said they did force a focus and a, and a kind of um and also an acceleration to a certain extent of of, of capability and um it's it's interesting because at cybos this year I, I i agree with you in terms of your your reflections but i also thought sort coming back together there was a, there was a certain kind of energy about the banks that were there yes. it almost felt like you know having had you know the last few years being fintech dominated and that fintech really driving the way the wave if there's not a terrible metaphor um it, it felt almost like the banks are back this year did you sense that too 100 percent. i actually um i had the feeling that the energy of the hall was reversed mm, mm. um it felt that the banks had come back energized to be back in person, full of plans, some amazing announcements, including from my, my previous employers, BNY Mellon, like really, really um, exciting. And it was equally um, heartwarming for me to see the ambition and the size of the announcements, mm. but also the genuine joy that came mm. with it. Um, meanwhile, the, um, the fintech side, although it was sizable and there were some incredible maturing companies there, mm. it was mm. more subdued. The mm. feeling that um, the funding party is over. 
that challenges will be navigated. And the vast majority of the companies I genuinely hope will survive, but but it won't be unscathed. So I totally agree with you that the energy was reversed. And I, I do wonder whether to some extent that's because <clears throat> the surprise that the banks would have the first few years that would they would come into Cybos, they would come into the inner tribe, the innovation wider space, and there would be jarring moments of, of mm. feeling that the economy is moving faster than you, the yeah. industry is moving faster than you. And I, I will say this, that it hasn't been smooth, but the bank <laughs> has been learning. Yes. And, and maybe there was a sense coming this year after too long a time of being mm. apart, of going, you know what? We're learning how to do this. Mm, mm, mm. So that's a really interesting, interesting point, and I, and I, I think that's a, that's a great insight that the banks are are learning. How, how do you see the sort of the more you know forward thinking firms? I mean, I, I know you work with a number of them. How do how have they adapted? Do you think how they approach digital transformation? Uh, you know, uh, uh, over the say the last sort of twelve twenty four months. It's. Um... I'm gonna I'm gonna have like a little bit of a shameless plug now, uh, Nick, because I I have a book <laughs> coming out next year which is dealing with a lot of this topic. So mm -hmm. boys and girls, go get bankers. Plug is pl all year. plugs are cool, <laughs> and, and I, as you can see, I'm a fan of great great books. On well, you're now, getting right? a copy, so just... um, it, because the, the question you ask is 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 something that I've been thinking a lot about, um, and and it's one that I deal with in the book. So one of the things that I have decided. Um, in my travels is absolutely key is that transformation is driven by people who are objective and honest with themselves about what holds the organization back. Mm, mm, mm. When we started this journey, the veterans, you and I, we genuinely believed what held us back was knowledge. Mm, that if mm. we learned these new things, if we understood them, we would be flying. Mm. The reality is there was an undeniable knowledge gap and the learning economy is something that we have needed to get our organizations onto. But actually yes. there is inertia created by human constructs and human structures and and, mm. and human habits. And yes. that inertia is natural. Mm. And the only way to get transformation moving inside a big organization is to know where it comes from and mm. know how mm. to work through with and around it. Mm, 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 mm. And fundamentally, and, and that's to a very large extent the, the, the topic of the book. So a, a question very, very close to my heart. So mm. I don't think that right now the real driver of transformation is the size of your budget mm. or the technological legacy you have and how much it holds you back. I genuinely think it's the type of leadership that sees clearly mm. to the future and is honest with itself. Mm -hmm. about navigating mm -hmm. from where you are to where you're going. Because mm -hmm. I keep saying this to my, my clients and prospects, everyone wants to start either from a blank piece of paper or from much further down the path than where you actually are. Yes. You yeah. have to start from where you are. And it sounds like a truism, yeah. but every failed transformation program out there, if we're honest with ourselves, failed because the entities didn't start from where they were and they weren't honest about exactly what holds them back. So to your question, it's the leadership that is honest with itself about what, particularly in their own organization, is likely to trip them up. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think that's incredibly well said. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of purpose-driven innovation because the, the purpose should guide the organization that then the strategy is a way to fulfill the purpose and then the innovation is then a way of fulfilling the strategy. And, that, and unless those things kind of align, line up and are driven by people, you know, and the leadership from the top, then then uh, absolutely, it's it's very difficult to be be successful. I'm sure we've we've both seen that. Yeah. So. So we promised the audience the good, the bad, and the ugly in, in this session. So, so let's do the good first and, and go to the positives. Um, we've seen a lot of progress, I think, in the in industry's use of, of technologies in 2022. Um, so, so maybe what do you think are the, are the sort of successes that come to mind in, the, in particular for the year? I mean, I, I'll start close to home and say that sitting inside 10X, seeing big global banks embrace cloud native core mm. 
is something that if you asked me 15 years ago, I, I wouldn't have imagined. It would have been one of those, mm. like, you know, when Lenin said yeah. we won't see revolution in our time, and then, you know, he was wrong. Um, a little bit like that. So I think, um, I think if anything shows how deep our understanding and learning has gone, both on the regulator side mm. and on the bank side, is the fact that yeah. um, 10X and, and our competitors in this space have clients who understand what resiliency on the cloud right. means. And right. actually put their business on the cloud and, and yeah. put sort of high value, high volume business on the cloud. I, I think this year has been real proof of innovative thinking outside the lab, which is what we've been advocating mm, for. Mm, mm. Um, I will also say that we're beginning to see the, that work put to good use. You, you're mm. beginning to see people going to the next order of magnitude. And I'm working with a, a client at the moment that I'll, I'm hoping we can announce next year that... Um, that say, okay, if I move my business to the cloud and I have clever data-driven credit scoring, mm. can I use my unit economics that are lower on the cloud and intelligent credit scoring to provide products that are truly inclusive, not mm. just for the bank mm. account yeah. and it's yeah. And it's the threads of our thinking for the last 20 years coming together by people who understand how to use the technology to drive change. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that that coalescing is important because you and I have discussed this before in, in years gone by. You don't get to pick one technology. You have to do no. all of it. Yeah. And that's the magic and we're beginning to see that. The other piece that I'm, um, I'm excited about, although it's sort of less uh, close to my day job, but very close to my heart, is that I'm a big believer that innovation has to be in the plumbing. Like mm. the deeper you go, the more valuable it is because that's where the costs are acquired. That's where the delays are acquired. And maybe when my mom is trying to do something at the far end, she has no understanding of why it costs so much. And if I try to explain clearing and settlement to her, she might be like, <laughs> how does that have anything to do with me? <laughs> the reality is it does. Yes. So actually seeing the work that you guys are doing, everything from Swift Go, mm. looking at, the perennially underserved SME SMB world, but also the work that is being done cross border uh, on CBDCs, and mm. we should get to it. I have certain concerns about civil liberties mm. not thought through, uh, mm. but when we look at the um, institutional, the plumbing side, we're really taking on the big hairy problems. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely, and that's uh, that's totally what we're you know what we're passionate about as solving in, in in Swift and the and and the work we've been doing this year on on CBDCs is at that very much that that kind of plumbing level, looking at how the basically the new plumbing can work and how we can design the new plumbing better than the old plumbing, right? Because you don't just want to replicate the existing system; you actually want to look at okay, well, what could this do to to really make a, a better and efficient experience so that your your grandmother or, or at the at the end right does actually have a better cheaper way to pay um it's i mean cbdc's is a fascinating one and i probably put this in the good for this this year um i think we've seen momentum build um we've obviously all now got over 100 central banks exploring a digital currency in 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 some form and i guess I guess for me, I think it, this topic, at least over this year, maybe slightly longer, but at least this year, has sort of gone from, oh, that's kind of interesting and it's going to happen in five years' time, <laughs> to actually this is now really happening and you've got key central banks really getting deep into design issues about the how in addition to the what and the why. Right. Is that is that how you've seen it? Have you seen any particular breakthroughs that have caught your eye in this area? Um, I, I think we've gone from, I remember having a, a webinar during lockdown on CBDCs. And there were people who should know better on there who still didn't know how it was different from Bitcoin. So actually, <laughs> not really, you know what? People need to ask these questions so we can get to answer them, right? Yes, so I'm yes. actually a big fan of people asking the questions that I go, oh my God, I'm so glad mm. you asked this because we would be talking at cross purposes so badly. So mm. I think the maturity and speeding up of the understanding and nuance in that space in the last two years has been staggering. Mm. Mm. And I do agree with you that <clears throat> you see the central banks getting deep into the technicalities. Now, there's something very good about that and there's something potentially bad about that. The potentially bad is that we don't see a corresponding effort around the ethics, protection, mm. 
How do you extend the right to be forgotten? Mm-hmm. How do you extend the GDPR? How do you extend what we in a European context and a North American context consider basic civil liberties? Because some mm. of the governments that are driving um, this work have different notions of citizenship, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's not that we're doing it badly, so we're not doing it enough. But I would say mm. on the good side, some of the um, case studies that we're seeing looking at cross-border, cross-currency settlements is exactly the use case we should be looking mm-hmm. at. Mm-hmm. I am very excited to be seeing that. And I'm not naive. I know that we are a good few years away from full adoption. But I think we're reaching the tipping point. I don't think mm. it's one of those experiments that won't see the light of day now. And that's no. very exciting. No, I, I, totally, I totally agree with you on that. And I, and I do see that momentum building, particularly around the wholesale type use cases, right? Um, and, you, you know, I, I'm not going to have, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that's, you know, that feels like the wholesale use cases are going to happen a lot faster than the retail ones, just because, you know, the, the, there's, there's there's more to go off to, and, and actually in, there's a, there's a, there are fewer considerations to solve for, whereas in the retail space, all of those pieces about privacy and everything, you know, come into play. And it's really, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, no, you're, that's you're very right. I do think that um, depending on how you set it up, actually the individual identifiers will be traced all the way through, right? So mm, actually mm, mm. we will need to have a think about that because yes. you will actually find yourself in a situation where the central bank has every transaction you've ever made. And should they be that way inclined, they would be able to have some very definitive views about your mm. lifestyle. Do mm, you want mm. your government to have that information? Sure. Now, there's a question about whether they would ever look at it, but I yeah. think from an ethics perspective, we should think about it. Um, yeah. I, I also think uh, on the on the sort of less sinister side, um, I, I did a, an interview actually yesterday about this topic and, and I was saying, and maybe it sounds flippant, but I was saying that everyone is a customer of a bank. Mm. So even if you don't have deep banking expertise, you know what your pain points are as a consumer. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the reason why we've seen much more innovation on the retail side is that. Yes. Whereas the group of people who know how clearing and settlement and who understand the the complexities of multi-currency settlements, that group of people is small. Mm, mm -mm, That's true. And that group of people has gotten together now. Yes. And they're talking about it. So I, I think the ability, it sounds like getting all those governments to collaborate is an impossible feat, but actually they've done it before and they've done it yeah. well. Yeah, and, and when they coalesce, they come to they come together and drive it. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. Yes, I think I think that's a that's a really important point, and I see definitely see that too. I, I'm conscious of time because we're having a great conversation. It's going to fly yeah, by, so <laughs> for the audience, we better cover also the bad and the ugly. So um, let's talk a bit a bit maybe about about the bad and you mentioned trends going in the wrong direction in terms of fintechs and funding uh, you know wh- wh- where, where do you see we are on that and and you know is fintech is, is vc for funding for fintech coming back anytime soon um so it's it's not a doomsayer situation to say that almost every company has announced mm-hmm. a, a, a sizable downsizing in the mm-hmm. 50 20% and in the crypto space, even higher. It's arguable that there was bloating. And every mm. founder you speak to offline will say, well, you know, you make poor choices when you're mm. very well capitalized sometimes. Sometimes. And you mm. make them for good reason. But sometimes throwing people at something doesn't give you acceleration. So there sure. is an element of correction that is very, very bad for the individuals affected, but might be good for the industry. But when you start looking at 20 30%, it will definitely affect productivity. It will it will mm. slow you down? It will affect morale. They will rally for sure, <clears throat> but but I think this is going to be a hard year for startups. Mm. I don't think we will see widespread VC funding come back anytime soon. The way we had seen it, people are still investing, mm. Mm. Um, but either they have a very different investment thesis or they're investing in a different type of company. It is a golden moment for some mm. companies. I'm, I'm on the board of a very exciting company called Flag, Flagstone Investment Management mm. and fantastic leadership who looked at the opportunity and said, cash platform, this is our golden hour. And they've um, 
reacted and Mm. they're leaning into the opportunity. So it's not going to be just doom and gloom, but it does raise a question of viability Mm. because we have had a lot of money pumped into companies. And you and I have seen big checks written for companies that had uh, a very cool PowerPoint and uh, like a a confident founder, right? Um, And some of those companies, where are they now? And some of Mm. those companies, have grown to be great things. I think that building sustainable businesses, building businesses that can stand on their own two fe- mm. feet, no matter what, will become top of mind in a way that wasn't mm. before. And if that isn't fintech coming of age, then I don't know what is. Yeah, 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 ab- ab- absolutely. And and finally, a focus on revenue streams, right? <laughs> As opposed to you know, you know, the the great idea, but but maybe you know. It, where is that gonna? Where is that gonna be to generate sustainability? And how long do I give you for your great idea? Absolutely, absolutely. Real? Do I give you ten absolutely. years? I don't think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was the bad, the the ugly. So for me, the ugly in twenty twenty two was was really about kind of the 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 risks of unregulated assets coming to the fore. Um, yeah. You know, yes. crypto collapse of FTX most recently, and uh, obviously, the, you know, the founder being arrested yesterday, right? So, no, so oh, I was like, this is more material for our thing, which yeah. and then shame. Have, have we reached peak crypto? Do you think? And and where did where, you know what 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 impact will twenty twenty two have on twenty twenty three for crypto? <laughs> I mean, um, there was a cultural thing surrounding the crypto community with the the. The found that I mean the, the person we're talking about not wearing long trousers ever was a bit of a fu statement, right? And the crypto bro culture is is a standing joke in the industry. Mm-hmm. And you know, you I heard of people who would have calls with their investors in bikinis because they live in the Bahamas. I think that um, cocky attitude will mm-hmm. probably go away. And okay. Um, this, I mean, I don't want to defend any of this, but this is not a crypto challenge. This is a governance mm. challenge. So yes. there is a there is a world where these things could have happened. Mm. Businesses that dealt with something else, but anyone who's in the more alter, um, traditional finance space wouldn't dare because their 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 clients would be like, I want to see um, who sits on your risk committee. I want to see your yeah. governance. I want to yeah. see your um, and the reality is, I think this is the end of unregulated crypto. Mm. This is the end of crypto as a world apart with the rules don't apply. Yes. Mm. I mm. think, do you remember back in the the last crisis, well, the government came in, started talking about casino banking and separating oh, yes. yeah, yeah. casino banking. Yes. Like and, broad and narrow banking and all of those debates, right? And the reality is that where they were trying to put the line was artificial. But mm, there mm. is a world where you have, you know, dark pool trading. Mm. And yeah, sure, that's a world apart. But actually, derivatives are part of the real economy. So yes. regulated holistically. So I think we will have a bifiguration of crypto because there's some of it mm. that can be a world apart. And if they want to gamble away their life with no governance, now they know what happens. Mm, mm. But there is a world with crypto assets in particular um, that is increasingly connected to the real mm. economy and you know welcome I, I would welcome regulation because i look at all of this and it's a governance issue i mean we this is not the first high profile startup arrest we've had recently no, right? no exactly and exactly that had nothing to do with um with crypto and everything to do with governance again yes and, and bringing that into the 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 the, the regulated space actually could could it, you know ironically it mean that they're actually we can realize the benefits you know faster right um I'm, and, and i'm a big believer in regulation because i, I wrote a piece about 10 years ago calling uh, the regu- regulator a little rascal and i was surprised that they enjoyed that uh, but uh, what i have seen in my career that's coming close to 20 years in this industry now is that decision makers incumbents people who are used to what they know and what they're good at will use the regulator as the boogeyman mm. for not doing things. Yes. And yet in the last particularly 10 years, the regulator has been like, this is not good enough and pushing yes. the boundary and raising the bar. <clears throat> yes. So a lot of the innovation we have in our hands as a consumer now 
across Europe, Australia, I would say um, Singapore leading the way and in some pockets of North America, it's because of the regulator. Mm -hmm. So the regulator stepping into the crypto world is no bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with you on that. Um, cool. Uh, so we're, we, we've almost finished up our, our uh, 30 minutes or so, and I've got some great audience questions. Before we go to that, I'm going to do some quick fire predictions for 2023. So make, we're going to make it really quick later. Um, so if we're back at the same time next year, which topics do you think we'll be talking about? I think we'll be talking about um, fintech, labor market, contraction, and whether the pendulum is swinging and people should be snapping up opportunities in the year after of the survivors who are really ready to go. Yeah. I think big institutions will not have taken their foot off foot of the accelerators. I think in some ways next year will be the um, the year for the institutional players to shine. Great. Great. Well, look, that'll be fascinating to see. Next one. Will we see some countries, big countries go live with digital currencies next year? I don't think we will see it in a in a big way, but I do think that the experiments will will scale because it is a I mean, for me, the most interesting things I want to see go live are those cross-border settlements. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take one. Yeah. But I think some of those experiments will start getting real meat on the bone yeah. um, and the maturity. <clears throat> you know, when, when something there is a tipping point after which the growth is inevitable. Yeah. I really hope we will reach that next year. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And, and as you said, we haven't had yet a big public debate on programmable money and public implications on that. Do you think we'll have that in 2023? I don't see any big institutional entity driving that. Mm -hmm. um, so frankly, Nick, you and I should instigate it. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good follow up for us. I like that. I like that. Final quick fire question. Uh, what will be the biggest fintech buzzword of 2023? Oh, God. I don't know, actually. Oh, you, you surprised me with that one. Um, I mean, last year was BNPL. God. Um, <laughs> that was a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, last year's was BNPL, and I couldn't have predicted it. Um, mm. I think it will be um, corporate actions. I think it will be M&A events. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, we've got some innovation going on in the corporate action space. So, um, so kind of watch this space on, on, on that one. Um, let me go then to the to the audience questions. We've got loads coming in. Thank you, audience, for, for your question. Um, I'm going to uh, let me see. Uh, question from from uh, Tapan Agarwal: Are we at the peak of inflated in expe expectations or the trough of disillusionment? <laughs> <laughs> if you're a fan of the hype cycle, oh man, that could be the title of a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Love that question. Thank you, I Tapan. I think we. I anticipate and sort of hope for a paradigm shift in terms of um, the VC-led understanding of value. So we have been, uh, because we have been in a cycle led by VCs for the last 10 years for sure, uh, we have been focusing really heavily on what matters to VCs. So it has mm -hmm. been, uh, say numbers use so if you're doing b2c uh fintech where it's been user numbers rather than unit economics yeah. um and and there's a there's a logic behind that but if as the vcs are beginning to pull back and sit on their hands i i think we'll see a paradigm shift so the answer to the question is a little bit of both but mm -hmm. as we go into that paradigm shift we start measuring new things you'll see a massive massive change to the way the the, um, the economy operates because mm -hmm. you focus on what you measure right even if yeah, you measure yeah, it absolutely. not believing it is the most important thing at the beginning by the time you finish your cycle it has become the most important thing because you mm -hmm. focus on it yeah 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 good point good point let's then take a, a question from from capil thank you capil for your question um uh capil's question is about uh, the sme business space uh, which fintech innovations are really finding applications in the uh, the SME business space, which, as you said, perennially underserved, right? So if you asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would have told you that some of the innovations are um, sort of jobs to be done driven. Some, mm. some of the stuff that Metal mm. had done early in the day going, yes. what's the most scary thing for an SME? It's, it's balancing 
income, income, incomings and their income and, and outgoings. Yeah, so yeah, actually yeah, having yeah. a calendar view of obligations was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Now I will tell you that the way we approach the question is, what's the challenge with SMEs? They are either shoved into retail banking plus, mm -hmm. or they're shoved into corporate banking, 90% of which they don't have corporate treasurers <laughs> in a five person company. Yeah, yeah. Um, and nobody has really solved the problem for them. Mm -mm. Because they needed a bit of one and a bit of the other. Mm -mm. So actually, the issue is not so much at the jobs to be done level as it is at the infrastructure level. Mm. So the way we, for instance, at 10x approach the SME space is by saying, well, actually, we're a modular platform. So if you need KYC, KYB type components and mm. credit scoring that is more on the corporate end, but actually everything else is more retail, just compose it so i would say that the biggest challenge has been at that um infrastructure layer allowing you to compose an offering that is affordable that mm. isn't too heavy or too light um without reinventing the wheel i i love that composable banking i think that's that's a that's fantastic and and that you could just you know as you said that, you could just see all the possibilities coming across not only SME space, but exactly. loads of the ability to create really, uh, really distinctive personalized services, right? That's huge, yeah, um, for client, different client, client groups. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I'm going to slip in one last question because Tapan has a, a fantastic final question, um, which was picking up on my comment about purpose-driven innovation. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, um, uh, Tapan's question is, people say that for uh, digital currencies, digital assets, they're still looking for real purpose. Do, do you think that's true? I think for a very long time, uh, it would have been true. It was a solution in search of a problem. And we saw some innovation that was deeply comical. I don't know if you remember mm. that big four consulting firm that created a non-immutable blockchain. And it was like, <laughs> it was the most interesting thing. It's called a database, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You had that and it was less expensive. Um, so we've seen some nonsense, but nonsense is definitely um, part and parcels of learning and part mm -hmm. and parcel of people not wanting to be left behind, but also not wanting to do too much. <laughs> I think we're past that because the minute you start applying it to big systemic challenges and start applying it to things that are actually difficult now, mm. um, then then it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that everything we will see will be useful and usable. And mm -hmm. I also don't necessarily believe that this is where the train stops, right? right we might right. be here in five years time and have a new technological application that solves for everything that made this particular way of working, um, made people hesitate. And we have another better way of solving for things. But ultimately, why are we here? We're here to serve the communities mm. that need access to money to live their lives. And that could be credit, that could be credit notes for, for, for companies, or it could be, you know, syndicated loans for, for, right. for governments. But that's all we do. We're here to serve. And if we can use technology in a way that makes that better, mm. then that's successful. Will it be always in each individual instance 100% the right thing? No, but but that's part of the journey, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I and I think there's still something to really here to to be done about making money truly digital and fit for purpose in that in that digital economy. And then you know that 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 then becoming to serve to you know the benefits of of of, of customers, clients, and 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 exactly. on all of that. And I guess that's that's a great way to wrap this, right? Is 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 it's it, you know it's it's still all about the evolving customer you know needs and expectations um and uh, and we'll continue on on that journey 100 uh, later thank you so much I, I knew going into this it would be a great discussion uh it was you know far you know ahead of my expectations excellent to have you uh, on the sh on the show um this was a very uh, special in episode of inside innovation live and i, I loved the fact that we were able to take that, that sort of a that kind of broader perspective that is all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for, jo for joining us. Um, we will be back in January, and we will have uh, the 2023 series of innovation, Inside Innovation Live. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, happy holidays if you are taking those, and uh, see you again next time. Thank, thank you, you later. Bye.